Well, good morning. How's everyone doing? All right. It's not, it's not terrible. We can work with that. Well, we're so glad that you're here with us this morning, and uh, we get to finish up and wrap up this series we've been going through. Uh, it's all about you and me, and uh, we've gone through a number of different one another statements over the last few weeks. And uh, just to remind you, in case you've forgotten, because there's a good chance you did, and that's okay. I had to remind myself. We've talked about what it means to encourage one another. We've talked about what it looks like to carry one another's burdens, to spur one another on, to confess your sins to one another, to forgive one another, to honor one another. Last week, we looked at what it means to have harmony with one another. And this week, we bring it all together. In fact, the, the element and the focus of this morning is really... It is the essential ingredient in all of the one another's. I know, best to last, right? So, the reality is there's actually over 30 one another statements in the Bible. And all of them demand and require this at the core. Love. I know, shocking, right? Like, wow, we've never heard a message on love. This is going to be new. No, we, we know that. But we're going to dive in this morning right out of the gate. So if you've got your Bibles, open them up, turn to 1 John chapter 3. So if it's an app, if it's in your actual, you got like one of those old handheld ones where you actually have to like physically turn the page. Uh, wherever, wherever you're looking into God's word this morning, open it up to 1 John 3. And here's what's exciting about this. You see, we're going to dig right in because there's so much in Scripture that talks about what it means and why it's so important to love one another. And most of us have heard what the Bible says about love. We've, we've heard messages, but today we're going to realize that that's not really enough. In fact, we need to be looking at this and why we need to look at it over and over and over and over and over. I think you get the point. Over and over and over again. So while you're turning there, let me read you a couple other verses that deal with this. And we're not going to take time to look at all of them. We're going to spend most of our time in 1 John. But, but let me just share with you a few others. Romans 12.10 says, Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Romans 13.8 says, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Ephesians 4.2, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. 1 Thessalonians 4.9, now about your love for one another, we do not write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. Hebrews 10.24, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. 1 John 4.11, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And the very next verse, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. And the list goes on and on and on. So many verses that focus in on our purpose and our calling to love one another. And that's where we find ourselves in 1 John. And we're not going to read all of chapter 3. In fact, I'm just going to highlight a few specific verses that we really want to look at this morning. And so in chapter 3, starting in verse 11, just read with me in, in whatever version you have. But in verse 11, it says this, for this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love ourselves. No. No. Just making sure you're still with me. I know we're only a couple minutes in. We should love what? One another. We should love one another. Skip down to verse 16. This is how we know what love is. It's almost like John knows what the people reading this letter at this church were thinking and what he knows we're going to be thinking when he re we read this. They're like, well, yeah, but, but what does love look like? And, and can I wiggle my way out of a love that is costly or that that expects a lot of me. He says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, 
and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? It's a tough one. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. He's going right for the jugular. He's like, listen, this is everything. This is what all of this is about. And then skip down to to verses 23 and 24. He says, and this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know what that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Listen, all of these things, all of these things, building up, building up, and then he says, listen, like what what does God command? What does God command? What is it? What was he referencing? What was this in connection to? Well, I'm not gonna have you turn there, but in the Gospel of John, John writes this. As he's interacting with Jesus, he was there with Jesus side by side, and Jesus says this. It says, and this is his command. Sorry, wrong verse. This is Jesus saying, a new command I give you. He's telling his disciples and his followers. He says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you have heads filled with scripture, no. If you have lots of faith, no. If you give tons of money, no. If you love one another and all of this in the same connection with what he also tells his followers he says listen this is the most important thing you could know and somebody tries to trick Jesus and they're like okay Jesus if if you know everything what's the greatest commandment says teacher which of the greatest command what is the greatest commandment in the law and Jesus replied this is Matthew 22 It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then listen to what he says. And we need to hear this this morning. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Everything. It it all boils down to those two things. That's it. Love is the highest law, the greatest commandment. Love, love God. The second is like it, love others as yourself. It's so simple and yet so difficult. So simple yet so difficult. And and I gotta ask you, do I really, really need to this morning stand up here and try to build a case that we're supposed to love? I really don't think I do. In fact, I would say that if you are here this morning and you don't even know if you believe in in the Bible or you're not even sure how you feel about Jesus and this whole thing that we've been talking about and worshiping this morning, I think we all can agree, no matter where we find ourselves this morning, that we know there's an expectation, there's something ingrained in us that we know we are meant to love others. So I'm not trying to build a case that that's what we're supposed to do because we know that that's what we're supposed to do. So why don't we? Well, well that's, that's really kind of the question that gets things rolling, isn't it? Why don't we? Why is it that we can come in here on a regular basis and have conversations and, and be in small groups and, and, and go to conferences and listen to all these different things and still need to be reminded on a regular basis that we are meant to love God and love others? Well, that's where it starts to get really challenging. And this is what we want to spend most of our time on this morning. Because it's not just as simple as saying, well, you know what, sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes it's not safe. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's not painless. Sometimes it's, it, it's costly. Yes, absolutely, it's all those things, and we'll address that. But I think there's something else going on here. I think there's a reason that over and over and over, God, the prophets, Jesus himself, his disciples, even the angels remind us, we 
are supposed to love God and love others. And it's because of this. Here's the good news. Ready? Everybody ready for some good news? Good. I don't have any. Uh, But I'll share this. No, it is good news. And here's why it's good news. Because I think sometimes we need to be willing to address what is actually being seen in the mirror. When we look at our own hearts and our own lives, not just on a spiritual level, but just a pragmatic, daily, what's happening right now level. Because when we do that, then we can grow. Then we can see God impact us and impact our world. And so this is good news, so stay with me. It's just not going to sound like it at first. Because here's the problem. Whether you realized or not coming in this morning, we all suffer from horrific memory loss. Now, some of you are like, yeah, I already knew that. Or, yeah, my wife already knew that. Listen, I'm not just talking about the stuff that I deal with. Like, you know that feeling. You walk into another room and you think, why did I come in here? Okay, that happens to me all the time. Like, way too often. That's not the only kind of thing we're talking. We're talking about The fact that we fail to remember what Jesus has done for us on a regular basis. I wonder how many of us would say that there are days, if not weeks, maybe even sometimes months, that go by without us really stopping to remember what Jesus has done for us, what his love means for us, and that we are called to love him and love others. And we need to be reminded of this daily, that he did love us. He still loves us. He's continuing to love us. And what that means in terms of our call to love others. Because the reality is we all have horrible, horrific memory loss. And just in case you're one of those people that you're sitting there today and you're like, nope, not me. I've got exceptional memory. Okay, This is going to be more on me than you. But I took a little study that that they had done on people who sit and listen, specifically students, anyone who listens to a talk that lasts around 30 minutes. That's you this morning, by the way. Here's what you need to know. This is super encouraging. In the time it's going to take most of you to get in your cars and get home, 29% of you will have already forgotten what we talked about this morning without some kind of trigger to remind you. 29%. For all of you doing math at home, that's like that whole section right there. I'm not saying it's that section exactly, but the rest of you should not feel all too great about yourselves just yet. I'm feeling very self-conscious right now. So, here's the worst part. It It gets worse much faster. Within 12 hours, Okay, within 12 hours, 64% of you will have forgotten. So it goes from 29% to 64%, and the day's not even over yet. Whew. Wow. Oh, it gets worse. 24 hours from now, 76% of you will have forgotten. Without some kind of trigger to remind you what we talked about this morning, 76% of you will have forgotten. But for those of you who are still thinking, I'm the 24%, hold on. Within 72 hours, that's Wednesday morning, by the way, 99.2% of you will have forgotten the message without some type of trigger to remind you. So if I don't remind you of anything and I simply ask you, what was the message about? 99.2% of you, that means like one of you or one and a half, which I don't, I don't know how that works. It, it, it gets ugly. Listen, here's what you need to understand. We all suffer from memory loss in a very real way, but also a very spiritual way. And I, I don't say that to knock any of us. I say it because we need to be aware of it. Because here's what is interesting. We do remember things, all right? The bad news ends there, I promise. The good news is we remember things. How many people can remember a phone number that's not your current phone number. It's awesome. So you you do remember things. 
things that are important. Here's what happens to me. I can still remember the phone number that I have not had since I was in kindergarten. It's not as long as you think, but it's long. Listen, there have been times I've been at a store and had to recite my phone number, and all I can think is that one. That phone number hasn't been in service since 1985. I'm just saying our brains are weird things. Okay, how many of you right now, if I forced you, could remember a random weird commercial jingle? Yeah, guess what? All of you that don't have your hands up, you probably could too. You're just being modest. Listen, we all have those, right? Like the little jingles that the minute you hear it, you start reciting it or you start singing it in your head or even worse, you can't get it out, right? Anyone here ever lived in the Chicago area? Empire Carpet. See? Everyone knows. They're like, oh, no, now it's in my head. I can hear him singing. Listen, every single one of us have things that trigger, right? We do things in life. Music. They've proven that music is actually one of the things that anyone suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia, there are parts of the brain that never stop working. And music triggers those. Listen, there are things we remember. Spouses. Just a quick tip in case you don't, you should remember your anniversary. And definitely your spouse's birthday. Just throwing it out there. If you don't, now's the time to double check that because they'll be checking after the service. But we remember things, right? We remember things that are what? That are important to us. And we even remember things that aren't. Okay, so back to this. So why is it then sometimes so difficult for us to remember the most important thing in the world? I'm not exaggerating. And yet we forget. We forget that God loved us. We forget that we are called to love him and that we are called and commanded to love others. And yet we can remember the most ridiculous jingles ever created and forced upon the human race. So, what does that mean for us? What do we do with that? Well, I think there's a few things that we can do to help us remember, and one of those things is we have to take the same intentionality with God and his word and his people that we do with things that matter. I know for some of you, you have been forced to memorize things in life, sometimes by choice, sometimes by force. I have kids in school, and trust me, some of the things they have to memorize, I'm memorizing with them. No one told me that when you have kids, you get to go through school all over again. But I'm memorizing things like the Gettysburg Address, I'm I'm memorizing poetry and all kinds of, I mean, it's crazy. Listen, but we can do this when we focus, when we're intentional, when we build it back into our lives. And so there's four things, if you've got paper or a notes app or something, that I think if we were to engage in these things on a regular basis, we could actually create new habits that would create a new way of approaching God and his people. And so that's what we're going to do this morning, just really simple, really practical. So what is it? Well, here's the first thing. Again, really simple. This is not rocket science. This is not like the most revolutionary message you're ever going to hear on love. But my hope is it's something that gets us thinking differently so that we're not constantly coming back and be like, oh yeah, how'd I forget that? But we're saying, no, that's part of my life. This is who I am. Here's the first thing. Number one, remember the cross. Remember the cross. What does that look like for you on a daily basis to be reminded of what Jesus has done for us? What does that mean? 1 John 3, 16 says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Listen, we need to be reminded because it's going to show us and remind us the depths of love that Jesus has shown to us. And the reason that's important is because we need that kind of example. For some of us, we stop at the easy stuff when it comes to love. And we need to be reminded that love is so much more, 
so much more than what we often make it out to be. Jesus sets for us this incredible, incredible example. In fact, it says in Scripture, what greater love is there than this? Than that a man would lay down his life for his friend. Jesus laid down his life for us. But listen, we were not his friends. He loved us first in spite of ourselves. But we were not his friends. We were dead to him. Antagonistic towards him. At the very least, indifferent towards him. Hostile toward him. There are people now, still today, hostile toward Jesus. Hostile to his gift of life and of love and of forgiveness. Listen, he died for all of us. And he did not die simply because he knew that we would turn our hearts and eyes to him. He died even for the people who never would. That's love. And some of us, we want to make it this thing where as long as we have a good relationship, I will go to the ends of the earth for you. And Jesus said, I will go to the ends of the earth for you no matter what. So we need to be reminded of what the cross means, that he, the author of life, would step into the narrative and become the payment for our sin. What we owed, he would take on himself. He would put himself on the cross. He would take that punishment. He would die. He would be buried. And then he would come to life three days later, defeating death and hell. And somehow, some way, on a regular basis, we forget that. Or we just fail to remember it. And we need to be reminded of what that meant. That kind of love. His unending, perfect, relentless pursuit kind of love. There's so many stories in scripture where we see God unwilling to give up on his people. Passionately pursuing them. Just look at Jonah for some, some odd reason this week if you've got extra time. Read through the book. Look at how many times God has the opportunity to just say, okay, Jonah, enough's enough. And doesn't. Relentlessly and recklessly pursues him. It's that kind of love. That's who our God is and that's what we need to be reminded of with the cross. That Jesus would leave the comforts of heaven of the angels singing around his throne, that he would come to this earth and he would take what we owed. Listen, that is love. And we need to be able to love that way. But in order to love that way, we have to be reminded of how we've been loved that way and continue to be loved that way. Because it came at great cost. And we can't escape that. When we look at the love of Jesus, we can't escape what it cost him. And just as a quick little side note, for some of us, we want so desperately to be people that when we love others, it results in us receiving and winning some kind of parade down Main Street. And what we need to realize is that if we really are loving like Jesus, what we might win, what we might win is a cross that costs us everything. That's the love that Jesus showed us. So, what does that mean for us? Well, it leads us to the very next thing. We remember the cross, and as we do that, we will naturally be forced to count the cost. Just write that down. Count the cost. You're like, why do I need to do that? Because love is not some simple thing. We cannot address it as it's this trivial thing that we could accidentally slip into throughout the day. But something that we have to engage in intentionally. That we would go out into our world and out into our day saying, how can I love like Jesus loved today? Not just this week, but right now, today, in this moment. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes I've looked ahead and thought, okay, at the end of this week, there's this big thing coming up, and I'm going to love in that moment. But today? <laughs> no. i got to save my strength. i got to build up 
for that moment. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. Don't worry about tomorrow. What about today? Count the cost. 1 John 3, 16 to 18. Just read through these verses again with me. If you still have your Bibles open, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. That should be an indicator right there, that there is great cost to this kind of love. Because it says, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Could you wrestle with that this week? Wrestle with, like, what kind of moments am I having where Jesus brings along an opportunity for me to love someone and I don't, because the cost is too great. Time, finances, discomfort, whatever the case might be. Listen, to love as Jesus loved means we're constantly looking for ways that he loved, and we're gonna constantly be brought to places where we realize it came at a great cost. He even tells his followers, he's like, listen, you want to follow me? You want to love the way that I love? You want to be my disciple? You want to start looking and acting and breathing and sounding like me? Luke 9, 23, he tells his followers, he says, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, there goes half of social media, and take up their cross daily. Daily. Not once, not for some big grand moment, daily. Daily. Every day, from this point forward, pick up your cross. What is a cross? An instrument of death and punishment. Oh, happy news. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Do as I do. Love as I love. Give as I give. Pray as I pray. Listen, we have to count that cost. Because I think all too often we hear this like, love God, love others, and we're like, sweet, that's easy, I'm in. And then we actually go to do it. And Jesus brings situations and people across our path that are not so easy and not so simple and not so black and white and not, not one of those things where we're like, oh, that's really easy to forgive or that's gonna be really easy to honor that person or that's gonna be easy to take the high road. No, because it's hard. We have to count the cost because these things come in difficult moments. They're, they're messy. They're uncomfortable. It's risky. It's costly. It's self-sacrificing. It's humbling. It's difficult. Yay. But it's worth it because it's life-changing, because it's world-changing, because you've been changed by it. And there's people waiting to be changed by it through you. So, if that's the case, if we've counted the cost, then, then where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us in a place where we probably need to be reminded and encouraged and motivated again. And so can I just encourage you with this third thing that we need to recall the commandment. Recall the commandment. The commandment that Jesus gave his people and that he still gives us today that we are built on, that we are focused on, that all of this falls under. Matthew 22, 36 to 40 is not the great suggestion. It is not the great encouragement. It is the great commandment. You're like, well, seems a little heavy-handed. No, it's the greatest blessing we could have ever been given. Imagine living in a world where you have thousands of rules, thousands of explanations of what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to live, and you have to remember all of them. And then remember a Jesus who is so gracious and so merciful that he says, listen, I'm going to sum all this up. If you do this, you do it all. If you love me with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love others as yourself, you accomplish all of it. All the law, all the prophets, all the commandments, everything, everything fits under those two things. Just like that. 
You're like, yeah, but what about, what about honoring people? Yeah, you, you can't honor people without loving them. Yeah, but what about forgiving? Yeah, that's going to require love. What about patience? Have you met me? Do you know how much patience I force God to live out in me every day? A lot. Listen, I'm, I guarantee you, everything you can come up with falls under love God, love others. And it's so simple and yet so profound. And it encourages us and it moves us forward. Because that's what this is all about. You could and you will forget everything else. And only remember, what are we supposed to do with this life? Love God. Love others. And that brings us to the fourth thing. Live the calling. Listen, I know some of you are in this place in life where you're wondering, like, what am I supposed to do with my life? What's my calling? Where am I? You know, maybe you're in the middle of a transition. You're trying to figure out what this looks like. Listen, I already know. I know what your calling is. I'm just that good. No, I, I know it because it's the same for all of us. We are all equally called in the same way to love God and love others. That's it. No other calling, no other task, no other obligation comes even close. And I know for some of us, we're like, well, yeah, but how does my job fit into that? I don't know. You get to work that out. But it needs to be worked out under that understanding of love God, love others. We live out the calling. We live it out. That's why we're here. Love God, love others. Like, well, that seems really simple. It is. Until you go to live it out. And then it becomes a lifelong calling. It becomes something that we engage in. And listen, for all of you wondering if you're going to fail at this, you will. We will all make mistakes. We will all have moments where we do not love well. We do not love to the standard that we should have. And God's grace is there. And his spirit works in us. And we try again. And we get back up and we learn, and we move forward, and we continue to love, and we love well. John 13, 34, again, we read this before. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. Do you know what that means? It means in the way that I have loved you. In the same way that Jesus has loved you, with so much grace and forgiveness and patience, with mercy, with tenderness, with gentle prods along the way, that is how we are called to love. Love in a way that calls us into places of truth, that calls us into places where we are the embodiment of mercy and forgiveness. That is the love of Christ. That is how we're called to love. Again, John, 1 John 3.18 Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Since I've talked a lot, let me just sum this up for us. There's some really easy ways for us to live out this calling. And hopefully this gets your mind thinking in a new way. You may have noticed that there were no announcements earlier. It's because the things that we talk about up here, they're opportunities for us to love, to love God and to love others. Benevolence. Benevolence is a way for us to love others through generosity. Benevolence is something we take an offering for the third Sunday of every month. And it's an opportunity for us to meet the unique needs of people in our community. Even, you have, you have no idea how many people come through our office every week. And we have some incredible people who work through that with them and talk them through and listen to their stories and, and try to gain them support and head them in the right direction. And it's because of things like the benevolence offering where we're able to meet those needs, sometimes challenging and heartbreaking needs. But that's how we love, by giving. Yes, you can love by giving. You're like, oh, well, I didn't know that. Yeah, now you do. Generosity is a way for us to love. Here's another one. How about praying for each other? Lifting each other's burdens up to the Lord. Praying for people all through the week or even this Thursday night, we have a prayer meeting here at the church. Come, pray for people, encourage people. 
It's a way that you can love others or serve. Roll up your sleeves and get your hands dirty. Give of your time and of your gifts to serve people. We have something that we do on a regular basis around here called the car care clinic. They need people to serve to make that happen. It's a way for us to meet the needs of people in our community, especially single parents who maybe can't take care of things. And and for them, it could mean the difference of, of even being able to get to work to provide food for their families. Listen, this is not a small thing, but it's an easy way for many of us to love, to love others and to love God. It's not always the complex, big, monumental moments. Sometimes it's the simple, easy, and obvious things that God brings right across our path today. How do we love? It's so essential. So as we wrap up this morning, can I just encourage you with this, that that we maybe need to spend less time pursuing judgment and vengeance of striving to prove ourselves right or superior or better than or, or whatever, that our pursuit is meant to be love, to love God, to love others. This is what it is. We are a people who tend to suffer from amnesia of love. We are a selfish people with terrible memories but it doesn't have to stay that way. We can learn, we can grow, we can remember. And so can I just encourage you with this as we wrap up? As we finish our time this morning, we live in a world that is waiting desperately for us, desperately for us to recognize that they are dead and asleep and they need to be woken up. They need to be woken up by the sound of love being lived out in action in our lives. By a people who are so passionately in love with God and so desperately looking for ways to love the people around them that they are willing to love at great cost to themselves. That we are not a people who are known at stopping when it's not easy. That when love becomes something that actually takes us outside of our comfort zone that we give up but that we are a people who love the way Jesus loves us. That's revolutionary. That is world changing. That's how we're called to love. If we could remember to love that way, not just this week, but today. Let me just read this as we close. 1 John three eighteen again. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you that we can come into this place. God, that we can worship you, that we can show our love to you, but God, let it not stop here. God, let it not stop with some words that we sing or or some motions that we have here. God, let it be the beginning of how we go out of this place loving you and looking for ways to love others. Regardless of the cost, regardless of it taking us into uncomfortable, messy, and difficult places, but that we would love you and love others because we have been forever changed and we would want nothing else than for everyone that we know to experience what we have experienced. To be loved the way that we have been loved. So Jesus, move in our hearts. Remind us of the cross. Help us to count the cost and see that it is so worth it. To recall the commandment that we have to love you and love others. And that we would live this calling out with all that we are. In your name, Jesus, we pray.